Hi, I'm Danielle Barosler, and this is Unordinary Made Ordinary, where we discuss the extraordinary experiences of everyday people. If you would like to continue the conversation after this interview, feel free to join our private Facebook group. Today, I'm super pleased to be speaking with Mary Rodwell. She is an Australian researcher in UFO and contact phenomenon who authored two books, Awakening, How Extraterrestrial Contact Can Transform Your Life, and New Human, Awakening to Our Cosmic Heritage. She's also produced two documentaries, I believe, and is the founder of a CERN in 1997. I don't know the, what that stands for, but I know it has to do with um, extraterrestrials. Yes, Australian Close Encounter Resource Network. Thank you so much, Mary, for being here with me today. A pleasure, Danielle. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, I'm, I've been looking forward to speaking with you um, because you are so knowledgeable and you've been doing this for such a long time. Um, and I would like to hear a little bit about how you, how did all this craziness start for you? Well, it, it's it's interesting how things unfold, and I do believe we um, probably plan how how it does. I started out as a nurse and a midwife, never in a million years thinking um, 40 years ago that I would end up traveling the world talking about UFOs and extraterrestrials or whatever. But from nursing I and midwifery, I you know ended up having a family, and I got involved in counseling and learning about counseling because. I found that what was wonderful about that was you were, in a way, preventing illness by dealing with people's emotional issues and what have you. And that that resonated with me. And when I moved over to Australia, I continued to do counselling. I worked in grief and bereavement. Um, and that's really wonderful in the sense that people are facing their mortality, you know, um, in hospice and what have you. So it gets you into, really, a, an introduction to the spiritual realm. I've always been interested in the big questions anyway. So, you know, if it was weird and wonderful, I've always said I've got a book on it, you know, somewhere. <laughs> you know, I was one of those intrigued always with, you know, what we call the paranormal, the supernatural anyway. So my interest in life after death, all that kind of things was very much in the mix when I work particularly with grief and bring where you get people who or, or those that are dying and they're saying, what do you think or whatever? So it brings up all those big questions. And from that, really, and to cut a long story short, I got involved in um, hypnosis and you know, um, exploring past lives, including some of my own, and finding that really intriguing because I found that some of the phobias that people have are often related to not this lifetime but another one. And to see the shift with people when they explored it and cleared it, how that could clear the phobia, which I, I loved, and I loved all that understanding. But then it, it, it was a very, the catalyst was very quick in terms of going from that into people having other lives on other planets. And it started out with a gentleman who had walked into my um, office saying, I hear you're open-minded. <laughs> this, there is, there is no support groups. For this, they just think you're a loony. His name was Ellis Taylor. He's a good friend of mine. We've known each other nearly 30 years now. And he told me about waking up with marks on his body, shaved areas. His partner was having experiences, the children. He said, the relatives just think, that you know it's demons and that we've got demons visiting he said can you help fortunately as things always are synchronously only a few weeks prior to that I picked up two books that interested me one was communion by Whitley Strieber with the, the ET you know the alien gray on the front um, as an experiencer and also the book by Dr John Mack the Harvard professor of psychiatry um, who wrote the book abduction human encounters with aliens and I thought, well, here's a psychiatrist, professor, that's saying, I, I now believe this is real. And here's someone who's having the experiences and believing it's real. And then Ellis walks through the door a few weeks later. And I thought it was very rare and thought, oh, this is really interesting. I was doing advanced counseling at the time. And I took his case to supervision with this mix of social workers, the uniting minister and all these thinking, well... If you want to know about my case, this is one of mine. You can say he's crazy or you can give me some insight into this. 
And what was fascinating when I presented the case, not really sure whether think Mary was loony as well, <laughs> was basically they started talking about their own weird and wonderful experiences. And they were saying, oh, I was in a haunted house once. And so it, what it did was open the door for people to open up more to that what was going on for them. But the big thing that that said to me was modern psych, uh, psychology was not exploring this, was not allowing for multidimensional experiences. Where do I get answers? Because there was no answers. People were saying, well, I experienced this, but there's no answers to that. How do you deal? How do you support someone who's having multidimensional experiences other than say, well, they must be crazy and send them down the psychiatric route? Um, and that was, a, for me, the catalyst for exploring and I, I got in, you know, um, Dr. Max uh, peer group and what have you, realizing there were more open minded organizations that could support this. And from that, I met a social worker that was having experiences. We started a support group where 12 people turned up um, from the very first support group. And then it, it really hit me that this was a lot more commonplace than people realized, or at least I realized. And then that that created a CERN, um, which I decided, well, if there's no one else doing it, where do people go? There's plenty of counseling options. There's plenty of people doing all this other stuff. But what happens to people who have got nowhere to go that need support with this? And that was why I created the Australian Close Encounter Resource Network. From then, three and a half thousand people later, families, children, globally, this is what I've been doing for almost 30 years now. And it has expanded in terms of my own understanding. But my understanding is that I believe not just thousands, hundreds or thousands and millions, possibly billions of people are having contact of some form or another, even if they don't understand exactly what it is. They may see it in a spiritual context or in a cultural context. But if you look at it closely enough, you realize that there are people all over the globe the a part of that uh, contact with non-human intelligences. Explain, because you said uh, somewhere I read um, that people gain multi-dimensional ex, um, awareness from NDE or alien contact. But what exactly do you mean by multi-dimensional awareness? What I'm saying is that other part of us, which I call the right brain, multi-dimensional side, not the 3D analytical um, cognitive part of us where we think before we speak and we analyze and we work through logically. We've got another part of us, our sensing, our knowing, our feeling, our intuition. And some people will be seeing beings or seeing energy or feeling energy. Um, they may actually have downloads of information which they can't quantify in a third dimensional way because it's not something they've consciously learned. They just know stuff. And they'll say, I just know things. Or they're having some form of communication with some kind of intelligence. They may see it as their spirit guide. They may see it as ET. They may see it as angels. They may see it as elementals or, you know, in a religious way, it may be, you know, um, the Virgin Mary or, or some other religious figure. What it really is saying is we have the capacity on another level to access our all those different frequencies or we call realities or dimensions and and when i say that we know just have physical non-human intelligences which visiting the planet in physical craft etc we have intelligences that access our consciousness interdimensionally extra dimensionally transdimensionally beings that coming from our future so it's not just all physical at all and when you go out of body, you are not physical, but you are still a consciousness that is traveling and you could go to other dimensions, parallel universes, you can go on craft. And one of the interesting things is that when we did the surveys with, with the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free Foundation, where we wrote the, you know, the book Beyond UFOs, what we discovered was with 4,200 people doing the surveys with 600 questions, that 75% of their interactions were out of body, not physical. That 75% were aware that they were out of body as a consciousness, not as a physical, when they were visiting the craft. Yeah, I've wondered about that myself because, I mean, some people have 
marks and like you said, mm. the shaving and that. Um, but I wondered if maybe a lot of it is like their astral body going or their yeah. energy body. Yeah. It's hard is to it- tell the difference, honestly. <laughs> and exactly, um, you know, because this is what I think confounds the traditional nuts and bolts ufologists is that you know because they're saying why can't you bring a bit of the craft back you know to show us or whatever um and the only physical things will be maybe implants or marks on the body or you know finding yourself in a different place than when you left you know um some people have found themselves outside of the house with all the doors locked because they've been picked up and put back again in the wrong place and finding that the clothes that they had on were not on their body anymore, but in the cupboard or under the bed or somewhere else. These are tangible ways they know something's happened. But for a lot, it is an out-of-body experience. And it's as real to them as, you know, the physical experience. And that's what creates a lot of the issues, as I say, with the traditional way of looking at abductions or contact um, or whatever, is that it's they put a formula that says it's got to be this way. Well, in fact, it's not got to be the, this way. And the other thing that we've discovered is the contact modalities do not just do it in the way that's the standard. Oh, you know, the beam of light comes through and takes you up onto the craft because other ways that this can happen and contact can happen is through having a near-death experience or an out-of-body experience or a shamanic experience or where you're doing healing and you start to connect to these intelligences, if you're doing energy work or what have you, or channeling. All these different ways can be contact with these intelligences, but it's been very marginalized in the sense of many spiritual practices, you know, that um, in spiritualists and what have you, they're quite happy as there was one young, several have said to me that belong to spiritualist groups. It's absolutely fine if we're seeing Jesus and Mary or we're seeing angels or we're seeing elementals or fairies. But for goodness sake, don't say, you know, there's a little four foot gray being standing here or a mantis being standing there or a lion being or a feline being. Because you can't say that because that's not spiritual. Um, not realizing that we are talking about many different dimensions and def- many different intelligences. And there are so many different forms of these intelligences that people are connecting to. Um, and so you're saying, well, I'm all right with angels, but I'm not all right if it's a feline being. So, again, there's this this judgment that some things are spiritual and some things are not spiritual, when in fact it is all part of the package. It's all in the same package. It's just that we've decided to to again separate it out to what's acceptable and what's not acceptable and that's been part of the issue with this is you know with the ufologists they don't want to take it to that other level either they don't want to make it so people have it out of body for example because that's not tangible enough we can't quantify that in the same way and that's been the issue with anyone that's working with this and working with people who have experiences because what happens is the more that they open up to their experiences, the more multidimensionally aware they are. So they will start channeling or they may get downloads or they may bring in scripts or or symbols or whatever. They may find themselves drawn to a more ecological lifestyle, for example, or change the way they want to live. They may decide that um, materialistic values no longer have any meaning for them. So it's a huge shift in their awareness and their philosophy, their spirituality. And that is the the evidence of contact, is how it changes people. And you don't change with, you know, um, some kind of imagination. You only change if something is really profound. And that's what I see is the changes after contact. Wow. I would imagine that um, having, like, having to deal with a, what you were programmed with education wise, um, Mm. what psychology um, would think about a lot of this as, as far as seeing little green, green people or hearing Mm. voices in your head. I mean, you would just be medicated and then there's religion, you know, like the programming Mm. from religion and what um, it, it just, it would be very hard. I think for an experiencer to even be able to talk about it with all that um, going on in the world too, like no one's going to accept it. You know, one of the reasons I wrote The Awakening was really it's a resource book. 
it's to you know for people saying how do I know this is real and I'm not crazy how do I deal with it yeah, how do they world? know like if you were to yeah. start hearing a voice in your head that's right there's all those things that are part of this that you know create questions and depending on your programming your religious beliefs all of those things can get in the way of you actually interpreting it in the way that's you know the truth of of what what is going on i meet many people that have had different you know become come from different religions for example that have said you know they're having downloads or they're connecting to some intelligence but doesn't but don't know what to do about it in case it's evil or bad and they've been told not to, not to accept all of that and are in terror of that or as one young man um which really and it's not the only time I've, this has happened a part of a belief system. I'll give you an example. I, I put it in the New Human as a, a, a young Indian man who wrote to me and said he's he knew he was a star seed. He knew he was star kid talking to the star beings. He said, my issue is that my family and most of my countrymen worship these gods. He says, you know, hundreds of gods they worship and what have you. He says, I know they're not gods. I know they're extraterrestrials. But he said, I can't say these are extraterrestrials, they're not gods, because most of my countrymen and my family believe they are. He said, so I know I'm a starseed, but I can't say that, even though I know from my heart that they shouldn't be worshipping these beings or whatever. So there's one, you know, big example, really, of what it's like in a culture where right. this is what is accepted or what or it's not accepted. And, you know, I've had those that have been brought up in very strict Christian kind of backgrounds, for example, and have been in this awful dilemma where they their parents are very entrenched in a particular religion, but the the child or the young you know the, the young person is aware of their own star child heritage and and very convinced of it, but saying, "How can I tell my parents I can't believe what they believe because that's not me. I don't want to upset them. And one young man said, I've committed, you know, I've thought about suicide because I don't want to upset them and tell them that that's not true. For me, I know I'm this. So you've got this, all these um, issues that come up, even if it's someone, and I've met many, many um, in families where their, their partner hasn't believed them or can't believe them or is too scared to believe them. So they're in this awful um, isolation where they're having these experiences and no one to talk to can't say anything to their partner and get driven to desperation because they may say well I know the family's having experiences but everyone's in denial and you know and there's nothing I can do about it and I can't talk about it so there's this because of our programming because of the truth embargo on this planet where you know governments are denying the reality of this when they know full well it's real it has caused the you know a huge amount of emotional psychological spiritual trauma for billions of people because they can't own their truth and understand more of what's actually going on to actually take that step and say well i don't care if you believe me or not this is my truth and this is the only thing that makes any sense to me and for my my work is about assisting that if somebody is ready to say you know what you may not believe me. You may think I'm crazy. You may think of all those things. But quite honestly, I have to do this for me because it is my truth. It is, you know, it is is who I am. And to give them the encouragement and support to say, own it, because ultimately this is the only way we're going to change this planet and change the consciousness and, wait, you know, get others to wake up. I was just told by a coworker uh, a couple of days ago that I talk about too many different things. Like if it was just ghosts or if it was just aliens, it'd be one thing, but I talk about everything. So he's like, you know, some people might think when they hear you that you're crazy. He goes, I don't think so because I know you and I feel like yeah. you're very honest, but he's like, it's like too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think talking about things is important. Now you mentioned your first book and that it's a guidebook. Um, Awakening, correct? Yes. So, so really, how, what is a guide, how is it a guidebook? Well, what I discovered when I realized this was a lot more prevalent than initially that I believed, because I thought it was quite rare, was what do people do if they're on their own, they've got a family who doesn't believe them, they know that in their heart they're not crazy, 
you know, do they go to a psychologist and hope that they're open? Psychiatrist is most likely going to stick you on medication and put you in. And I've met hundreds that have experienced that. So oh, I no, I've talked is- to a few myself, and I feel like that the medicines they put up on, um, like it yeah. somehow brings their vibration down or it makes them, yeah. I don't yeah. know, it's damp. It, sh- it shuts it down as much as you can say. And and the thing that stood that really was the catalyst for me writing the book in some respects was a young lady, of um, she was 19 when she contacted me, and I, t- I tell her story. Um, And when she contacted me, she said, I've just seen some things on the television that make me believe that I've had uh, contact with these, you know, ETs, that I've been abducted, etc. And she said, I don't know what to do about it. And she was she said that when she was 14, she went to the doctor and said to him, I think that I'm having contact with aliens. He said, there's no such thing and put her on you know, um, what we call really um, medication that basically, she said, nearly caused me to commit suicide several times because it was so heavy, the medication. She said, didn't believe me. And he, she said it was seeing something on the television. She had, I think she said it was an American chat show where people were talking about their experiences. And she, and she realized then maybe this was real after all. And that was a huge revelation. So she contacted me saying, I hear you support people. And I said, yes. And um, she started to visit me. Her mother was very ambivalent to start with because she was a Christian lady and she was a nurse. So, you know, who is this person, (laughs) you know, this crazy lady telling my daughter this is real? Um, As it turned out, she checked me out. She realized I'd worked with credible organizations and blah, 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 blah. She met me. We talked about it. And she started to understand that this was a reality. And I mean, for several years, I supported her and her daughter and even got invited to her birthday parties at the end of the day and this kind of thing. But what was so profound for her was going to these support groups and actually realizing how much of this was, you know, her truth and what have you, but causing her great angst that she'd been on this medication for X number of years that had completely messed her up. So it isn't something you can come off overnight when you've been on all this medication. And so in a way, that was part of the catalyst for me to say, right, how can I support? How do I know this is real? What do I do about the fear? How can I get support? What about these experiences where I see things and hear things? And, you know, you know, my multidimensional experiences, for example, Um, what about hypnosis? How 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 will that help or not? I even did a chapter on helping therapists understand how I worked to say this is, you know, I'm working from very um, a very standard client-centered process and explaining I've just expanded it to to a, a greater depth. This is the, this is so in other words, I was making sure that I was proving that everything I was doing was done with professional integrity, um, but also honoring multidimensional reality. And the reason I put that together as a kind of working manual was because where do people go when they've got they don't know who can I go and talk to? Who can I feel safe with? And I even said you can check out psychologists by your questions. In other words, find out if they are open to multidimensional experiences. Are they open to the fact we're not alone? You don't even have to give your name. You can say, um, I want to know you know, where you're at. Do you believe there's such a thing as intelligence is visiting the planet? If they say no, you know, that that's not the one for you. Because shall I tell you something? There's a story that I told many, uh, a number of times was a, a gentleman that contacted me who'd gone to see a psychologist. And he wrote to me and said, when he told her and opened up about his experiences, she said, oh, you must have had trauma in your childhood. So he said, that was it. He said, I gave up on her. And he, and he finally found me. What's amusing with this is the very psychologist he went to see contacted me um, about a year or so later and said, I had a gentleman come and see me who had experiences. And I said the standard thing, oh, it must have been trauma in your childhood. She said, I've discovered that I'm having experiences now. And I realize. (laughs) (laughs) Was it trauma from her childhood? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> she realized it wasn't trauma from her childhood um and 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 that's the to me it's just you know it's almost like a cosmic joke isn't it in a way you know this kind of thing it's 
I think they like to blame the parents and stuff, but yeah. uh, Uh, But you see what I'm saying is there are a lot of psychologists that I've met that have had experiences. Even psychiatrists have had experiences. But again, this is, you know, they can't challenge the model because at the moment mainstream still does not accept for for the most part yet that consciousness is, is primary that in fact all of this is demonstrating human consciousness and it's not just about our five senses but about our multidimensional senses which take in sensing, feeling, knowing, intuition, clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, all of those things and more that most people once that owning and uh, are ready to accept that are operating from these and the children particularly are operating from this this level and that's what I was just going to ask you about children because I wanted to know in your hypnotherapy working with adults and working with children if there was a difference between the two what is uh, well for the most part children don't need hypnosis and most of them will have con you know they have conscious recall you know they actually don't I have worked with them as young as 12 but most of the time when you ask the right questions, they already have access to it. And, and that's why I do, I've do. i got a questionnaire for children, because often the parents don't know what questions to ask because they, they don't know what the children and the child doesn't know what's um, OK to talk about and what's not OK. And they'll just come out with how it is for them unless they're shut down. Um, you'll get, you know, some saying that's not real, that's your imagination or whatever. And there's a big difference between some, a child's imagination and something that is real and tangible to them. And most parents will know the difference between this is coming from somewhere else or whatever. So in terms of the children, when I've written about their stories in, in The New Human, that is conscious recall. Um, that, you know, this is not them going into an altered state Although I will say this, for the, the deniers of hypnosis that try to say that it's it can be confabulation, it can be imagination and all the rest of it, which is one of the deniers of the tangibility of the information and what have you. I will say Dr. John Mack, who was a Harvard professor of psychiatry that worked with hypnosis, said quite clearly that he believed um, information from your subconscious had more integrity and was more accurate than conscious recall. And the reason for that is in conscious recall, we edit out what we think is not acceptable, whereas the subconscious does not. It says it as it's taping your experience. It doesn't edit anything. It just tapes it. So what you get is actually the integrity of the whole experience, whereas if you try and consciously recall, often you'll say, oh, well, I can't say that because that's too weird. Or, no, that that can't possibly be right. So, in fact, conscious memory isn't as accurate in many cases as subconscious recall. And that's contrary to what people want you to believe. They say, oh, it's confabulation or it's imagination. And there's a very distinct difference between imagination and the subconscious recall. Why do you think... um kids are so so much more they have access to it you know still all these memories and stuff like how is it a conscious recall for them and not adults simply because they haven't been programmed out of it um uh, out of their information and their awareness and their connection it's as you get more and more into the educational system and the belief systems of this planet which are generally in my view in my opinion Um, geared to limit your um, understanding of your human experience. In other words, the only things that are given credibility is from your five senses. If it's not from your five senses, then it's doubtful or it's suspect. Oh, and it's you just imagining all of those kinds of ways to dampen down all those abilities we have to access, you know, the multidimensional nature of reality. One of the interesting things that the scientists um, it was Russian scientists um, that were looking at DNA is they said DNA actually has the ability to create miniature wormholes into other realities. In Wait, other what? Words, <laughs> what? How? Miniature portals. The DNA, DNA has, has the ability to create miniature portals into other realities to time uh, beyond time and space. And that's how we access things like our knowing, our sensing, our feeling. All of those are part of us accessing that those other realities. 
um, and and we don't realize that that that's how it's done. That's you know when you have someone who's very focused perhaps on a particular bit of information. Say it's a scientist interested in a certain aspect of their research, and they're exploring that and they're putting out the frequency i want to know more about this i want to understand more of it they're sending out a signal um if you like an intent for information and that will actually go through their own personal guidance system if you like of their dna to it and they will pull that information to them and you know when you get several scientists all getting the same information what do you think they're doing they're just sending out the same frequency so they're pulling that information back and they, you know, you get several coming up with the same conclusion all at the same time. It's because when we put it, it's, put it simply, you know, when you get, I don't know um, if you've been pregnant or not, but I've been pregnant a few times. It's when you're pregnant, you suddenly notice everyone else who's pregnant that you wouldn't have noticed before. It's, it's part of what we focus on is what we actually then um, receive. We're putting out a frequency. And, and this is what happens with a lot of this information. You know, when people want to know more about it, they suddenly find, oh, they just come across it synchronously. Oh, I, oh, how did that happen? That's a coincidence. No, it isn't. You're putting out the frequency and you're pulling that to you because that's what we do. We're, we're, you know, we're like a mo- mo- our brain's like a modem that's pulling in the frequencies that we need to understand our reality. And the more you explore, the more information comes. And the same goes with our psychic abilities. The more that we are interested in opening up to more awareness, things start to click and things start to happen and you meet the right person or you pick up the right book or whatever. You're just putting out the frequency, I'm ready for this now. And we pull it to us. And that's how manifestation happens, you know? Well, I am very impatient and I don't pull it fast enough. (laughs) Oh, look, join the club. (laughs) <laughs> Join the club, find another one. I want everything yesterday or the day before, if possible. Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, so your book, New Human, um, is that mm-hmm. then about the new generation of of children, or is that is more that what that, that book is about? Yeah, it's more than that, though. Okay. the The idea of the new human was to start at childhood and and show how much the children remember of their origins, other past lives why they've come in, how they understand their mission, how they understand their purpose. Because for many star seeds, as a child, they will have had access to that or they would have been part of that themselves. So it's just giving them a reminder. And they'll say, you know, when I was a kid, I could do this or I remember this or I knew that I was different or I didn't belong. And what was I doing on this strange planet that I don't understand humans? And, you know, I don't want to be here. I don't like this place, all these kinds of things. So I started with some of the stories of the children because I say the children are not programmed at that point. They are coming out with more integrity to their memories and recall. And, you know, I I talk about this one little eight-year-old I remember distinctly. She was eight or nine. And she said to her mom, I'm a hybrid. And she, her mom said, what do you mean? She said, well, I'm part water being because the planet I came from was uh, I was a water being. And she said, and I'm part human. And she says, and when I look in the mirror, I'm seeing water being. And she drew the image of what she looked like. And she she explained that as a hybrid. Now, this is, you know, this is a child, you know, you have to look at this in the way that they're explaining it. And she said, and I can not only hear music, I can follow the frequency of that music right to the person who's created it and understand what's going on for them to have created that music. So now they're taking it to a whole new level of of frequency and understanding. This is not what eight and nine-year-olds normally talk about. You know, so my point is, this is just one story of so many that I come across and 10 year old saying it's his first lifetime that he he was blue. Um, He came from another planet where he was blue. This is his first lifetime. He's here to help with the pollution of the planet. And he's a healer. He talked about getting information, all this kind of thing. These are concepts that are not normal or natural in the way that we understand the way people talk. And, And certainly the one thing the parents say to me is, there's been no front loading. I've not said anything about anything because it's the criticism of mums or dads or whatever. And it's it's not the case at all. And I've talked to psych, psych, uh, psychologists that are open to this saying, well, I'm seeing these children everywhere. So to answer your question, the other th- reason why it was important is so many of these children are labeled 
ADHD, Asperger's, dyslexic, or, you know, some forms of autism. They're given these labels. What that label isn't saying is they're different humans. They have got different abilities, and often it's multidimensional. As one gentleman who realized in his 50s he was ADHD, and he said, Mary, I saw reality in a completely different way to anyone around me. And he relabeled his ADHD as always dialed into higher dimensions. And he wrote, <laughs> um, uh, he wrote close encounters of the ADHD kind. What I'm wow. indicating in the book is that these are not conditions and labels of dysfunction. They are showing the way that we are shifting in awareness to a whole new level. And it's because it's not understood by mainstream, because they're wired differently. And part of the reason I believe they're wired differently is to stop them being reprogrammed into um, a, a reality that is not accurate, that is limited and limiting to our consciousness. So I believe they've been wired differently, deliberately, so they're not programmed into that to prevent them from being um, uh programmed into that because it's the programming that shuts us down and then of course the rest of the thing is how do you help your child if they do have one of these labels how can you support that how can you know because it's no good just isolating the problem and saying well that's what we're stuck with what can you do about it and explaining how and also looking at the belief system you know I've got at the end I've got a lovely story of a medical doctor who now after a shift in her own consciousness in India now act literally activates DNA. She calls herself a shamanic MD, that she literally now works energetically with people to activate their, their DNA. So wow. it's showing the shift from not only children to how it goes and, and manifests in adults and, and their stories. And it's the stories that are profound because, you know, I, I one of the things is some of it is so challenging to our paradigm that you think well you can't can you say that and I'm saying yeah because there are people on this planet that know that's the truth and need to hear from others that they're experiencing as well no matter what you believe you know you take in what you believe but ultimately we have no idea what our reality is uh, there are people that tell me they go into parallel universes for example others that they experience other lives in in other dimensions and they are will visit them and that the, you know this whole thing about what is time and many of them are saying there's no such thing as linear time at all that it, everything's happening in right now and that's how we access past lives and all the rest of it we don't even have a clue about that because we're told very specific things about our reality and a lot of the time that's inaccurate and uh, you know um there's lots of books about what you've been taught to believe isn't true um, and I, I think that's exactly the case. We've been given a limited mandate that, uh, and that's why it never makes any sense. A lot of the time, you know, your life, you live your life and you think, well, what's the purpose of all of this? And you're cut off from everything that would give you purpose, which is your multidimensional, your knowing, your sensing, your feeling that is showing you from your multidimensional side, how to translate that into your 3D world and to bring them into alignment is what needs to happen i'm wondering if there's more kids being born now um who are, are you know unprogrammable reprogrammable yeah. um, than there used to be i think that that there's been upgrades um and one of the interesting things was one story i tell of a nine-year-old not only told me that he was from orion that he was a light physicist working on time tra travel technology he explained he'd been taken to an underground base. He was sat in a chair. There was a lady in a uh, uniform in front of him. And she she had technology to one side. And he said the technology was to bring down my frequency so she could put things into my head. And he said, I knew what she was doing. So I kept my frequency most of the time too high for her to do it. So these are pretty cluey kids. They know what's going on. That's amazing. And you're saying that they, for the most part, remember uh, why they chose to come to Earth and incarnate here. Many of them know their mission and their purpose of communicating with animals, communicating with plants. They're here to help with the pollution or the environment in some way because they, they 
are able to communicate on multiple levels. As one eight-year-old told me that he communicates with animals and he's here to help humans understand that they're conscious beings and that we have to treat them with respect. So that was his mission. Wow. Um, he did say that he was his ancestors were mantid beings and that when he dies, he's going back to being a mantid. So, you know, he knows his origin, if you like, as well. I mean, that's this is this is again way beyond what people can say. Well, that's imagination. It's just not, you know, it doesn't fit with the detail of the amount of information from especially young children. Right. You know, one seven year old explained to his 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 parents that he's a time traveler, that in the future he's a he is actually like a gray being. He's come back into this time to help uh, um, to help with the planet at the moment. And this is what I'm I'm saying is that the information is very, very profound and certainly, you know, way beyond anything they've seen on cartoons or because that's the, the favorite. Oh, they've seen this on cartoons or, right. you know, that not, makes sense. Yeah. Um, I remember yeah. one of the five year old many years ago, I, the story of a five year old where the mother was trying to tell him how they built the pyramids and, he, and she was explaining all the slaves, you know, building the building and moving the rocks and he said mom he said you're wrong that's not what happened because I was there and he said and they changed the density structure of objects large and small and they levitated them into place well that makes more sense than how they they try to explain like so yeah. many people dragging these yeah. enormous rocks <laughs> exactly and this is what I mean this is exactly what I mean is they still have access to that information. And more and more of the children that are coming through are doing that. And what was interesting for me when I wrote The New Human was I thought, well, it's going to be, you know, weird and wonderful for most mainstream. I've been amazed at how many psychologists have contacted me, teachers and educators, as well as parents, that this has made sense to. And that's sort of been a, a big surprise for me because I, you know, I, I know I'm pushing a lot of reality boundaries here by putting because I didn't edit anything that people told me because I thought if that's your experience, that's your experience and it needs to be honored, even if it's not mine, because we don't know what we don't know is my my favorite motto. You know, we we I have no idea any more than anyone else. I mean, the more you think, you know, the less, you know. So, you know, that's how I look at it. <laughs> The more you know, you don't know. <laughs> you know that, you know, I know that there's a lot I don't know. So it's it's a matter of just honoring the fact that, you know, you're joining dots and the dots could encompass the universe. It could just keep going. And I think that's what it is. We're here on a journey to learn and grow. But this is such a probably a minuscule part of what really is going on. So once you get that, it's very humbling, but it's also um, a, a bit of a relief too to think that you know that there's still much more for us to understand as we go along that's part of the human adventure isn't it that let's speak about the human adventure do they ever have uh ideas about why we incarnate on earth yes and like and they that's... have their ideas about why they their yes. mission right but why yeah. why why in general what comes through in in terms of patterns of understanding is many have cut volunteered from various places in the cosmos not just in our own physical universe but other dimensions other realities etc intelligences that have seen earth as a place that is needed um if you like help to awaken to a greater reality to you know they they call it many things to shift into a new consciousness and so many of them have said, you know, they volunteered. They volunteered as a consciousness. And as I say, and we're not just talking about physical realities here, we're talking about those that come from other realms as well, which we'd say, you know, as other frequencies, more aware souls have come in with their awareness, with their understanding, and with a mission and a mandate to help with this huge shift that's going on right now on this planet. And they're aware that this is what they've come to do. And for some of them, it's been the first time they've incarnated as a human and it's been very difficult for them. And some of them have said, I, you know, I don't know why I agreed to this because it's a lot harder than I, I planned it to be, you know, or I expected it to be. And some of them get actually so depressed by being human that sometimes they will be taken back 
to where they come from to, for a recoup, to recoup and then be brought back again. But saying, you know, um, whenever I've said and I've worked with hypnosis saying, have you on any level consented as a way of, you know, making that obvious to them, they'll say, yes, but before I came here. But some will say, I didn't realize it was going to be this hard, you know, because of, of what they're facing and whatever. But the consensus is that they're bringing their skills, their understanding and their awareness to assist in this huge planetary shift of consciousness to take us to a whole new level of awareness as a species, as a humanity, as a collective. And is that as like maybe there's a lot of humans on earth that were not star seeds and that's why they need help from these other places far off it's a hard one to say are uh, is that you know who are star seeds who are not i think some have incarnated not to experience that level of awareness because they've chosen to be more in the 3d souls have come from all different levels of choosing to experience certain things and there will always be those that choose to stay in a certain density for their soul's growth and there'll be others that say no I've come in because I want to be part of that shift and that activation the reason I say that is because I've worked with numbers of people who have gone in past lives and one of the interesting things is when you take somebody into a past life and take them through the death sequence you then find out, you know, I'll say to them when they've gone through the death sequence, and I mean, however they've died, starvation, limit, whatever it is that's happened, I'll say, what have you learned in that life? And they will say, maybe I learned about limits or I learned about, um, you know, uh, other ways of doing things in in terms of with love or whatever it is. Um, and then they'll say, um, and now I've chosen to have this experience and They'll talk about choosing their parents, they'll choose their siblings for growth and understanding in this human experience now. So for me, the way that I understand it is the soul is always seeking to understand and to grow, and it will pick certain scenarios for that um, to occur. And that's why, you know, we've got some that will stay um, and experience just a very limited human experience where it may be just a very standard life and you know, whatever, and others that seem to give themselves one challenge after another challenge. And they're the souls that really want to grow fast, that really want to learn things very, very quickly. So I I say that as far as I'm concerned, for me, how I understand it is that as a soul, I've said, right, I'm going back into the human experience. I need to experience this, this, and this, and this. What are the conditions I need to create those experiences so that I can learn and grow from them? And and that's how I see it. Is it's like a human adventure. A bit. I'll, I'll say you know on Star Trek. Those that watch Star Trek, I don't know how many do. I've always been a Trekkie fan, and they have the holodeck, and they choose to go back and experience the 1930s or the 19 what's names. I sort of feel like it's a spiritual hol- holodeck, really. <laughs> <laughs> a long. It feels yeah. like a long experience. I'm sure in the in the span of time, it's nothing. It's a blink of an eye, but. When you're here, it feels pretty long. Well, exactly. But I mean, I could be completely wrong. Um, But I do feel in some way we're co-creating whatever it is we experience. And, the you know, when people say, what about choice and free will? I think the free will is how you interpret it. You can either interpret it with the glass half full or half empty. What's your attitude to it? Do you want to be a victim or do you see yourself as a victim or do you see this as a path to growth where you can learn and grow from? Well, I mean, most people, I feel like they kind of agree and say that they chose, you know, there was a choice to incarnate yeah. and stuff. There are some people that say they're forced um, to mm-hmm. incarnate. I don't know if you've ever uh, regressed somebody that um, has a memory like that between life memory where they were kind of like tricked back or forced back. Not in in that way, because usually when I in hypnosis, I'll say, have you on any level agreed? Oh, okay. And I'm talking about your superconscious higher self level. Have you agreed? Because I think as a superconscious higher self, I don't see how that can be tricked by anything personally, because that's your superconscious higher self over soul. We're talking about source. I don't know if source can be tricked personally. It doesn't make any sense that it would be tricked. But I think on lower levels of awareness, it can maybe feel like that. 
I know that one lady said to me that she was part human, part ET, and I and she'd had a a, a pretty rough experience. And I said, "Have you on any level agreed to this?" And she said, "My ET self was fine with it. It's my human self that's been struggling." Now that may be a similar kind of thing where the human self is really struggling, but another aspect of them is actually accepting this is part of the journey. I mean, I, I can't dismiss anything because I don't know what I don't know. But right. And I think I people have a hard time when it comes to the the amnesia that we're born with, right? Where we don't mm-hmm. remember um, these choices that we made. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's kind of like having amnesia. Well, you may have chose to be here, but you don't remember and you don't remember why. And <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's and where that they feel uh, it's manipulated you know, or. Yeah. 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 And look, I can't say for certain. I can only go on my own research and my way of working with individuals in that space between lives, for example, where they go back to their soul grouping and whatever. I have never come across anyone that's been trapped um, in into a certain experience. So unless I do, at the moment, my understanding is that the soul that that isn't the case but it may be that on that level for them they that's how they feel and i can't deny that either because if that's how they feel that's how they feel whether or not that's totally accurate and when the other superconscious comes in and gives them a different perspective that's how maybe they need to feel or understand themselves for their experience maybe. Maybe somebody who f- feels that way or thinks those things should try getting hypnotherapy and find out what. Yeah, accessing that superconscious higher self. And one of the things that I work with is when I even do a hypnosis or as well as teaching people how to open up to their multidimensional self is asking, taking them through a program. I, you know, It's a kind of meditation, which is basically asking the superconscious higher self to release all programs, all limits, all blocks from this lifetime or any other that are limiting them from being all that they now choose to be. So you're giving an instruction to the superconscious self to say, right, anything that's getting in the way now of you understanding yourself with clarity, now it needs to be released. And that's the instruction. Um, And that's one of the things that has been very profound for people because it often shifts many things that have come, maybe not just from this lifetime, but from another lifetime or another experience that has still been part of their their signature, their soul signature. And it's giving a a, a direct instruction to the oversoul. We need clarity now. What would you say is the percentage of people who can access in a, in a session with you, like their over soul or higher self? Is it hundred percent? Yeah. I found that most people can do it that are ready. And what I mean by ready is that they're already starting to get downloads, sensing presences, seeing orbs of light, um, are feeling, a sense of uh, um, more that they can do, all this kind of thing, is they're generally ready. And what I mean by that is, I'm, uh, however you understand your multidimensional self, some people say, well, I'm just accessing my higher self. Fine. Well, this is one way to get clarity with your higher self so that you can be clear. Because for many people, they're almost almost there. They just need a few guidelines to with tools. I say, you know, like you're riding the bike, you just need to know where the brakes and the lights are you know, um, let me give you, help you with clarity. But for many, they'll see maybe they've got a life guide or a gatekeeper. They've got, you know, spirit spirit guide or whatever. They've got a team. And so what I can do with that once they've been through the program is say, right, now we're going to initially connect to your primary source of help and support in this life. And we want to know who they are, why they're with you, how many lifetimes, what do they look like, how do they communicate, what's, you know, have they a name or whatever, ask questions about, you know, who else is with you, what's who's in the team, who are they, where's their origins. In other words, what you're doing is getting the history and, and not only that, making it clear uh, uh, in a kind of 3D way so that it's more tangible because for a lot – it's still very intangible for them. You know, they say, well, I sort of sense this and I get this, but I'm not sure if I can trust it or whatever. There are ways that you can clarify that and center it so that you're working 
more with your 3D as well as your multidimensional in, in a kind of balance rather than it's all this or it's all this. It's actually bringing it into balance because I say to them, you know, there's many intuitives that come to me and they maybe been working all their lives in healing or readings or whatever. And I'll say, so who, who is it that supports you? And they say, well, I don't really know, but they're always there and they always give me the information. I said, don't you think you ought to find out because you've been talking to your best friend behind a wooden door? Don't you think you should open it and say, who are you? Why are you with me? You know, um, tell me about yourself. I said, because your best friend, if they're sitting in a chair, you want to know all about them, don't you? Well, you want to know why this intelligence is working with you. Who are they? Why are they with you? How many lifetimes, you know? So that you've got something solid to work with. And what do they look like? You want to know what they look like. You know, you want to know, have your name or frequency or whatever, you know. And then when you make that tangible, then they can work consciously all the time. And you don't have to be in trance. This is conscious. This is about you doing this consciously so that you can call them in if you need to. And say, what about this? What about that? And what are the... Do you do one-on-one sessions with people? Or is it over Zooms? How do you how do you do these sessions? This, um, you know, some come to because they want to come to my office, but most of it is, you know, not only here and uh, but overseas. So it's Zoom. It's not a problem. It, it doesn't compromise the connection and what we're doing. So it's it's through Zoom or it's through Skype. It doesn't really matter. It's recorded. What's the interesting thing with recording it is that meditation that program that I talk about, which is really actually quite short. And the session is com- is fully recorded. And when they go back to it, it can actually trigger more information. So you've got the frequency there. So it, it continues to work. But what it is, is, is it's like anything. The more you use it, the more that you are um, confident, the more opens up because that's that's the way that our ability works. The more that we be comfortable with it, you'll find yourself. To give you an example of one of the things that happened for me when I started to open up and what have you, I remember somebody showing on television something in one of the Indian cities and what have you, and they were showing, you know, how people are living and and some of them were living very, you know, in in really dreadful, um, harsh conditions. I could smell what that was like there. And I can, oh, God. And somebody else was talking about medieval times and they were talking about the cobbled stones and what have. Again, I said, oh, it's really smelly there, isn't it? And whatever. You, <laughs> you're finding your frequency is tapping in to more and more. And you don't realize that until it happens that you're, what you're doing is you're allowing your senses freedom to explore the multidimensional. And as I said, we, we, we are w- working through portals. We all can be a portal to anywhere. I remember one, I think he was eight or nine, I think he was eight or nine, saying that he goes to other planets through a portal in the runes. So he uses the runes as a portal. And he says, and you can go to any planet you like as long as you know its mathematical number. So he said, "Um, if I know the math, because it's a frequency, numbers a frequency. So he said, as long as I know the frequency or the number of that planet, I can go there. How does he know that? Because he... He just knows it because that's what he does. <laughs> wow. Wow. You are talking to some really, really, really interesting kids. And and they're just the tip of the iceberg. I bet. Literally. And this is, you know, all I'm doing is highlighting the fact that we've got this hot, huge shift going on on this planet. We're getting these new humans coming in that are super aware super talented our main job is to support them so they you know that so that we can help them do what they've come here to do and so it's about highlighting that to the parents and to those that are you know in charge of um, these beautiful souls to give them the best start possible because it's it's a tough place that they're in at the moment we're struggling as adults yeah wow well thank you so much for sharing all that um I forgot to ask. Well, first of all, I also wanted to know you've you must have had contacts yourself or <laughs> by now. Because you said that being gaining multidimensional awareness changes a person. So mm. maybe you haven't had an NDE, but you are aware that there's multi-dimensions just from talking to other people. No, well, one of the things I didn't mention is um 
I heard from another, I was working in a counseling agency and one of the psychologists there said there's a lady that's been told she's going to teach professionals how to open up multidimensionally. Are you interested? And I joined that group. And there were two others, there were two clinical psychologists, there was a nursing sister, there was a homeopath and a few others. And this this lady had been told that she was going to train them. And I spent three years with her and we did everything you name it, energetic work, channeling, um, different kinds of healing. You Well, you name it, psychometry, we did, we did the lot. And those three years consolidated that awareness because at the time, to be honest, I went more as, I thought, more as an observer thinking, well, Mary, you're far too normal, girl. You know, this ain't going to happen for you, but you can watch other people be amazing until I had a few shocks and realized that that wasn't the case at all, that I was not only going to be part of it, that I I had certain experiences that I cannot dismiss in any other way than than they were real. And ultimately what that did, when I finished, I was asked then to show others. And I, I taught two groups. One of them I called the left brainers, which were the professionals like the teachers and psychologists and people from that perspective and also the the creative intuitives where I was bringing into 3D and and grounding them and the other ones I was taking into multidimensional I I did that for two years training two groups and from that then I was the question was what do I do with this because I'm I you know people ask if you're doing readings I don't do readings but I I mean I can pick up plenty of stuff but I'll say I'm I'm going to teach you how to do your own readings mate because that's far better than me doing it for you everyone can do this everyone don't care I was going to ask you that you got to my question before I could ask you like can everyone do they have to be star seeds do they have to you know everyone has the capacity and I'll tell you that before this if you'd said to me that I could do any of this I would have laughed and said no but there are gifted people that can because I thought and saw myself as extremely normal you know, that was my vision of myself, practical, ex-nurse, practical, normal, whatever. But things happened that I could not explain any other than the fact that that was something that, and then it showed me that everyone can do this. We all have this ability. It shut down and it shut down, I believe, um, deliberately. And ultimately, it's just a matter of you allowing that in. And And the difference is when I say to people, with your left brain, you think before you speak right brain you speak before you think because that's when you're accessing all of it the only time that changes if you alter what you're when it comes in if you start altering it or coloring it and some channels can you know will do that because I can tell when it's a good channel and when there's not one Um, because there are some that are really good and they allow it in in its integrity but there are others that will edit as it's coming in so it's a matter of how well you're trained to actually make sure that you don't get in the way of it. And that's scary because I remember when working that way myself, um, bringing the information in really fast because I knew I couldn't alter it if it was coming in too fast for me to, because I wanted to be sure it had integrity. But everyone can do this. Everyone has the capacity. They just need to know how it works. And it's actually really simple. Kids do it all the time. They'll get insights and what have you from their team or their angels or whatever, and they'll just come out with it. Where did that come from? I don't know. It's just it just came in my head. What do you think meditation is? Meditation is allowing yourself the freak to be in the frequency to get that information. That's what it is, and it'll come from your super conscious higher self, or it may come from one of your guides or helpers or teachers. Um, what you need to ask is: is that from someone a source, or is that from me? So then you you question where the source comes from. Because I want to know who's who's giving me information. So it's not just this is the information. Who are you? Why I know a lot of the time who it is. But if I don't know a new source, I'll say who are you, and why are you giving me, me this, and how is it relevant? So the other part of that is then learning to question, so that you uh, can have it verified, so that you're not just believing everything that you get. Yeah, it's I like that you are discerning. You're being discerning. You know what I mean absolutely crucial when somebody says to me well I didn't know I could question I said it's it's absolutely crucial that you question but there there be something negative giving you information yeah and they can sound really you know all this 
but it's got to resonate. It's You've got your own BS meter. We are all born with one. <laughs> and we just lose contact with it because we think everybody else knows more than we do because we're taught we don't know anything. We need pieces of paper to prove who we are. Rubbish. We've come in with all the tools that we need to operate in this reality. And the problem is that we're told that's not so. So we question, we question. No, if you stick with your BS meter and you listen to what really resonates with you, and if you're not sure, you question. If if I get information from a source, I'll say, now prove it to me. And they'll have to show me some other way. I might look down and see 1111 on the clock, or I might look up and see something on, on, on one of the books. Or my whole body will just go, whoosh, whoosh, you know, like this energetic surge. Yeah. Okay, got it. I realize now that's okay. All right. And if I've got more in, more questioning, tell me about this. Why is this important? Because of what? Okay, I understand that now. So you you know, it's meant to be a cooperative thing. Not you're just there like a sponge, just taking it all in. Well, you know, I say, look, I'm in 3D here. You're not. This is how it works for me down here. Show me how that's going to work. So you have a working relationship that's equal. They're not above you or below you. They're an equal soul that's come in to give you guidance and help. But it's all equal. There's no, there's no hierarchy. The only hierarchy is what people say is because they are of a different frequency or vibration. But they're just a little bit more aware than others. But souls are all equal. We're all coming from the same place. We're all coming from source. Uh, would you agree that keeping your vibration higher is probably better to do? And do you have ideas of how to do that? Absolutely important that you keep on the most positive vibration you possibly can be. For, for why? Because if you're in a fear vibration, you're going to pull in uh, intelligences that work with fear vibrations, which are not high vibrations. They'll manipulate, they'll create more fear, they'll feed off your fear. So you've got to get past your fear. The next one's ego. Again, if you're tapping into ego fre frequency, you're going to pull in intelligences that are working on that frequency that will manipulate you and manipulate your ego. So you've got to get past those two. If you get past those of, two. I've heard of fear, but what is the ego? What is What would that be like an example of somebody that's working from that? Well, uh, the vibration? ego fre yeah. frequency. That's yeah. when that you've like got narcissist? someone... Yeah, it's it's people that actually believe their own spin about themselves. You know, the ones, you know, and you, I, and I'm not trying to be derogatory here, but there are many teachers around the globe that I think um, get pulled into the ego frequency. Because, um, you know, you can be a teacher that's coming out with all this beautiful stuff, but if you don't walk your talk, then it means nothing. We can all say pretty words. We can all come out with all of that. But if you don't embody it, and I've seen many teachers, when you look at their lives, their lives are a mess. And that's really- Are you talking truth. about teachers in the energy Spiritual spirit teachers, world? Or, you know, those, you know, gurus or whatever you want to call them. Okay. I'm not saying they're all like that. But the only way you really know the tester of someone is how they live. How do they operate? It's not just what they say. And some think it's enough to say all these beautiful things and they know what to say, but their lives are not embodying that. You've got to embody what you're talking about. And so the ego pulls you into, I'm better than everybody else. And look at me. And I'm, I know about all of this and know all of that. If you're in that frequency, you're going to get beings and intelligences that feed that and say, right. you know, that they'll feed from you and they'll feed information to you from that level the only thing that you can do is go to a frequency where your whole energy is is involved in the highest frequency of love unconditional regard and support and you know the the wish to connect with everyone and to be that to be embodying that that's a hard one and all of us go you know we can move around on that one sometimes we're better than some days than others but that's that to me is the final level of frequency that embodies all that we we wish for everyone else as well as ourselves is to be a, a collective of love and that's you know there's no religion in that that to me is just about treating everyone with love and regard that you treat all those that you love around you and yourself and it includes yourself this isn't about you know saying i love myself not in that way but in in wanting the best for everyone that you're in, you know, that you're connected to. That's 
that's enough for me. I don't need rules. I don't need anything other than that than trying to do. And sometimes you fall down and you you get negative and you get pissed off with someone and you say, hold on a minute. No, I'm falling backwards into old habits, you know. So it doesn't, you know, it's a it's a it's a hard task. But that's the frequency that I aspire to. It doesn't mean I always fit, you know, manage it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the challenge of being human, you know, when <laughs> certain things happen. But that's the bottom line for my philosophy really is just that. And that's why I don't subscribe to anything particular other than saying be who you, you know, true to yourself and true to that part of you that knows what what is, what is um, your truth, whatever that is. Well, um, I think we are running out of time, but I wanted to give you a moment to say a final message from your heart if you'd like. My message from my heart is to say every one of you on this planet is beautiful, a beautiful soul. And you've come here to learn and to grow, to trust yourself and to be yourself. And sometimes you don't have to do anything other than be yourself, to be everything that you mean to be on this planet. Just just love yourself and love those around you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Mary, for talking with me today. You're welcome. Um, and I want to thank everyone who watched. If you like this kind of content, be sure to subscribe to the channel, like, comment. We love to hear from you. And we will put the website links for Mary if anyone would like to contact her. And I know you said that you could be found on Facebook, right? Yes, that's right. All right. So thanks everyone for watching and have a great day. Mm -hmm.